Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining on this episode of Dream Big Daily. Whether it be your first, 10th, or 63rd time being here, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. As our guest for today is Adriel Lubarski, quintessential entrepreneur, salesman, good person, ultra marathon, ultra racer, I should say, quote lover, just like me. Um, as he's in the West Coast now, set up shop there in San Francisco. Adriel is focusing on his own company, Riveter, in 2020 that he recreated for those specifically affected by the pandemic, but those unemployed as it's an HR type company. And Adriel, I will say, is someone who's started, worked with, been a part of many startups. The more I've ever seen in all of my understanding of people, with people, interviewing people. So on this one, we dive really deep into sales, entrepreneurship, some quotes, but enjoy this episode, episode 63 with Adriel Lubarski as we dive deep. I have a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Adriel Lubarski uh, is joining us today. Thank you for hopping on. We're going to dive deep in many different facets of life, but I appreciate you joining us. Let's do it, man. We're going to have a good time. Yeah, and as we were talking pre-hitting the recording button, I would love for you to start off diverging away from sales and business, and you know that's, that's your life for the most part, but going into and dabbling into some other categories as you mentioned, a big, uh, you are a vagabond. You live by that as your Instagram bio part of it says. So I'd love for you to talk about the adventure you have coming up and how that relates to your 2020 ambitions so far. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's start with 2020 ambitions. So, uh, when COVID, I'm a big new year's resolution guy. So just pre COVID, but new year's resolutions are very important to me. I think whether or not you hit all your goals, I think they're a great opportunity to be reflective to say, hey, if I can plan my life one year out, what would be true? And when you write those things down, what would be true? You know, I'd be, I would have accomplished this, or I would have run this race, I would have started this, I would have closed this many deals, I would have uh, done this in my relationships, whatever those are. Once you write down what those things that you want to be true are, then you could say, what are the inputs I need to uh, be able to have in order to make those things true? So, Hey, I want to run a half Ironman. Well, great. That's easy to do. Go sign up and run one. But if you want to run one at a certain time, what do you need to do? All right. Well, three times a week, I'm going to bike. Twice a week, I'm going to swim. It's going to look like this, whatever. Then at the end of your following year, either you have done all your inputs and you've had an incredible year and whether or not you actually got your desired goal at the end of it is a little less, uh, at that point, it's just a nice cherry on top. So all that to say, this year, uh, we had set a lot of New Year's resolutions, and it was a very ambitious year. Personally, I said I was going to get engaged. Personally, I said I was going to accomplish certain things athletically. Personally, I said I was going to travel. Uh, we plan on going to Russia and to France and having these amazing trips. Wow. When I started a small business beforehand, I wanted to get it to a certain point. When COVID hit, a lot of people had these plans, and a lot of people all of a sudden said, well, you know what? I can't make my plans work this year. COVID's in the way. Uh, we decided that that was not going to be us. And so my fiance, who I did propose to, uh, we decided to go on a road trip, on a cross-country road trip, thank you. We decided to take mm -hmm. COVID and say, hey, we're not going to Russia, not going to France, but we are going on a cross-country road trip. And we are going to start in a couple weeks and we're getting rid of our apartment in San Francisco. And we're going to do travel the way COVID allows you to do travel, which is Show, some, show up somewhere, get an awesome Airbnb, stay for a month or so, yep. and move on to the next place when we're ready. That's amazing. I, uh, I love that you're checking off all the boxes. Cheers verbally. Cheers to uh, the engagement. That's, that's no small thing. Thank you, sir. We do our best. <laughs> I, I find it so interesting that the, usually a lot of good entrepreneurs love doing big ultra races. But that just describes more of their character and sort of their ambition. So it's like everything you would do, it's not like it all derives from like business and entrepreneurship. Everything you do kind of crosses over. So I was going to ask you, 
what is the crossover or like where did the development come from with this ambitious entrepreneurship side of you then also running ultra races and and then sales i know you have a huge focus in sales which you have a podcast around that we'll, we'll discuss that you've had many roles within startups with that but i would love to hear your sort of meta themes and themes for those crossovers with all those areas of your life i think part of the part of the meta theme is that if you're the kind of person who's putting yourself in a position where you're going to take a lot of L's, you're going to take a lot of hits. You also need to put yourself in a position where you can get a couple of wins. And what that means to me is that you've got to be doing, if you're going to do something very difficult, such as start a company, you've also got to be doing things that are perhaps equally difficult, but require a different skill set but develop you in a different way so that if things aren't going the way you want them to with your business or whatever you're trying to start, at least you have other wins to fall back on. And there's always something driving you forward. There's always something going well in life that you can, that you can lean on when you need other things. So, you know, for me, for a long time, that was racing, uh, running things like Ironman or marathons or, or whatever else, but it also comes in other aspects. Um, it also comes in event series I love to run. It also comes in personal things, uh, such as my relationship. I think always having goals in a variety of categories. You know, people say put your eggs in multiple baskets. Maybe that's a cleaner way of saying what I'm saying. But if you're doing something incredibly difficult, having your entire mental state, your entire self-confidence, your entire purpose, uh, all tied up in that one thing is, is a big risk to take. So that's where, for me, you know, you mentioned uh, Half Iron Man. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where that came in. That's where a lot of other risks and adventures and attempts all come in as well as to counterbalance the, the uh, ultra risk of yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah, I see. Okay. And did that come over time? Did you develop that lifestyle design over time through uh... – stumbling your way there and through some failure or was it always like I got to modulate some things because I can't have all this risk sort of like the barbell strategy you know you can't have a ton of risk here and like no no easy side on the other side yeah I think a lot of it came from my mom uh as a kid my mom or to this day she has multiple jobs she's always doing a lot of things and sometimes you know, job number one doesn't quite go, but job two is pulled her across the line. And, and you know, my parents are immigrants. Uh, they both came from the Soviet Union. They took a massive risk. And so they had to mitigate that risk in whatever way possible. So my mother's always doing multiple things. So for me, since I was a kid, I had the same exact thing going on where I had multiple business starting up at the same time or every risk I took was counterbalanced by something else that could be going well uh, in some way. So I think that's really where, where it developed. Uh, and it's always been the case. I don't know if the idea has been put into words so clearly up until a couple of years ago where I was doing, you know, I had a couple of startups at the time. I was also teaching at the business school. I was also training for my first marathon. And I found that doing multiple things made me better at each one of them. Where if you're super narrow and you say, hey, all I do is this one job. If you got a bad day at that job, you're having a bad day everywhere. And you have also no other ways to get better at the job besides doing that job more and more. But if you have a lot of things that you're doing all at once, you know, if you're a student and you have a podcast and you have a side hustle of a job and you also train athletically, learning things in each category is going to make you better in all the other categories. Yeah, I love that. I, uh, I see where uh, you, you speak four languages now. I see where that comes from. And I see um, the understanding that because I, in looking through your experience, you've had plentiful amount of experience with building startups and being a part of startups. So it seems like that's always been in your DNA. But I always find it interesting, like the, the upbringing of an individual and how that crafts them into who they are. So I would love if you were to expand more into that story of your upbringing and even the time in which, uh, you know, I look to, 
even how that experience in Hong Kong, because I know you went to the Copenhagen uh, Business School, like how those different experiences um, were able to mold you on top of being an immigrant from Soviet Union, who we actually had a, a person on, Yuri Kruman. Um, do you know of Yuri? Yeah, I know Yuri. I was actually coincidentally just on the phone with Yuri right before you. No way. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, amazing person. But he has, you know, I think he was immigrated from Russia and went to Kentucky. Just super fascinating. So it's like that, that builds the person even more. But yeah, I, I mean, there's, you could read whatever statistic you want about how many immigrants actually go on to found companies. Uh, <laughs> and it's probably because like, they're okay with risk, you know, risk is just part of what it is to be an immigrant. Uh, for me, what's always been important, you know, I was lucky enough to be born in the US, but first generation, my coming from the Soviet Union, you know, entrepreneurship is basically synonymous with crime, right? It is illegal to be an entrepreneur in the Soviet Union. If you, you know, sell, if you may have a cow and the cow makes some milk and you sell it for anything more than the, you know, eight rubles a gallon that a liter that the government allows you to sell it for, you get put in prison for trying to make a profit. So that's the environment in which my grandfather grew up who was a very entrepreneurial person and therefore was automatically in the Soviet Union, a criminal. And he has been through, and he has started multiple business, all of which were criminal enterprises uh, in Russia. Then he came to America when he was in his fifties and that's kind of all that he knew. And he was this incredibly smart guy, this hustler, this guy who could really figure it all out. But all he knew was bribing police officers to get things done. So unfortunately his brand of entrepreneurship didn't land quite so well in the United States. My father, uh, so that landed my grandfather in prison when my father was in high school. My father then, who came to the US when he was 10 or 11 years old, had a little bit more of a chance, but still, you know, he grew up with an entrepreneurial spirit, but he had to drop out of high school in order to run a body shop that my grandfather left behind. So he never finished his education. And he still to this day is very entrepreneurial, but he did not have many, he didn't have the platform, he didn't have the floor, the high floor that I was lucky to be given after, you know, two generations, after, you know, hundreds of generations, but particularly those two that I know of, of bringing me to where I was. So when I was in, in middle school, I started my first business and it was so easy. It was so easy because my father gave me so many ways in which to do it. You know, he had a small marketing business. He introduced me to some people. I started selling some honey and then that built up confidence. And I finished my high school degree and they let, helped me go to a great college. And in that college, I took, you know, the, the study abroad program you mentioned where I learned international business in Copenhagen and Hong Kong. And then out of that, it was so easy for me to start a business because I knew if it fails, I can move back in with my parents which it did fail and I did move back in with my parents, but I didn't, my risk was so mitigated compared to what my father and his father had to go through that it was almost riskier for me to not try to follow their footsteps considering everything I've been given uh, in, in my perspective. So I think that's where, you know, every immigrant has their own version of the story. Uh, but my, my version is that people before me had it a lot harder and still gave it their all and so I, I, it's, it's my responsibility to do yeah. the same. I, I love that, truly. I, and, and did that, did you think about that when going through it? Like, one, I'm super grateful to be in this controlled sort of container of risk, but also like I, I am driven to do more because of those who did it before me. Actively. That, that one is something I, I recognize from like age 10. You know, like it's just, my, I grew up with my parents despise everything Soviet Union, like they ran away from anti-Semitism and from criminality and from, it's a very tough place. And so I grew up with stories of how tough that was and how remarkable American capitalism, American democracy are. And so since I was a little kid, I knew how lucky I was. I maybe didn't always know exactly how I would act upon that luck, but by the time middle school or at least high school rolled around, I had no doubt in my mind that following this path of entrepreneurship, whatever that, I haven't really heard of startups at that point. Like tech startups is a totally foreign concept until like late college, but uh, entrepreneurship, starting businesses, like that was just a thing that I knew I had to do and, and a thing 
and I knew exactly what to be grateful for because I, you know, the stories of those huge hardships were not very far removed from me. It wasn't some, you know, senile great grandparents telling us about her parents. It was, it was very different. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and did you grow up in the East coast and then go to UNC Chapel Hill? That's right. I grew up in, in Long Island, on Long Island, New York, yeah, uh, and, and went to UNC Chapel Hill for school. And then, so what, what wanted or pushed you to go over to San Fran and get involved in that tech scene? I know, I think you could talk about this. It was through another route that you went there, but nonetheless, like you ended up going into ADV type stuff. And I would, I would love for you to explain the interest in autonomous vehicles. Cause I know more if you sold that this year, um, and that was auto- that was delivery in some fashion. Yeah. Yeah. So the path to, you know, Steve Jobs has, has the quote that it's very difficult to connect the dots unless you're looking backwards. Right. And when you're moving forward, you just got to keep moving. You just got to keep trying things. You just got to do things that feel right. And looking backwards, it's like, Oh, well, I can see exactly how I got from here to there. So I, after college, I stayed in North Carolina for a couple of years and I worked on a couple of businesses. Um, one of them was this delivery company called Morph and it was a pretty standard delivery company. We had hundreds of drivers and they delivered food. And I found that interesting. You know, it was, it was pretty, it was, we started like shortly after DoorDash, you know, nobody had even heard of DoorDash yet. And I just kind of coincidentally started, but there was something that just didn't feel, I, I wasn't so driven as I wanted to be by that. And part of that was because we were paying drivers more than anyone else was in North Carolina and the whole region, but they were still having, they was still a terrible job. It was still exhausting. It still had no upward mobility. Like it was, it was a contractor job. So there's no insurance. Like there was just, it, it didn't feel right. So coincidentally at the same time, I was doing a podcast much like you and somebody found me at Research Triangle Park and they said, Hey, we love your podcast. We want to pay you to do one for us, which felt amazing. And they paid my buddy and I, $5,000, which was insane. Uh, we spent probably 800 hours actually working on it. So on an hourly rate, it was pretty tough, but $5,000 to do a podcast for them about transportation. And this was in 2016 or 17. And we did a podcast for them about the future of transportation. And that was the first time I really learned about self-driving cars. Wow. And we did all this research. We interviewed people. We put together this fun series about the future of transportation and self-driving cars. And I was really intrigued by that. So I was working on this other startup that failed, not the delivery one. That one kept going kind of as a small side business. And I moved back to New York to my parents, like I said, I would. And I spent a few months trying to think through what is it that I want to do next? What have I learned about myself, about things that I care about? Uh, and where do I want to move the world? And how can I kind of find the biggest lever with which to do so? So I looked back at these experiences and I said, all right, what did I not like about Morph? What did I not love about these delivery drivers in the company? Well, it was the fact that these people were doing jobs that maybe they were, they just weren't happy about. They were overqualified for. We had immigrants who were PhDs who just needed some extra money and they were driving burritos around. We had musicians who were so incredibly talented, but they needed the money. So they were driving Chinese food to your house. And that's great. You need the money and the money's important, but like talent wasn't being really used. And it was being lost in this kind of job. So I said, great. Self-driving cars will solve that, right? If you could have a car do those deliveries, well, then the musician could focus on music. And the PhD candidate could focus on getting a job in, in whatever they did. So I found a, so I started forming this thesis around self-driving cars and, and why I cared about it. And that brought me out to San Francisco. Um, I made a very specific goal. I said, I want to work on the future of transportation. This is while I was still unemployed. I said, I want to work on the future of transportation. I want to work at a startup of fewer than 20 people that has raised more than $2 million. And that has to be in New York. Unless it's self-driving cars, then it's allowed to be in San Francisco. I was very specific. And we can talk about why and, and what that looked like. But with that specificity, I found a self-driving delivery car company that had 10 people that had raised more than $2 million that was doing all of these in San Francisco, that was doing all of these things that I wanted to do. So in January, 2018, I went over there and it was in, in some ways, it was remarkable. Some of the most interesting stuff I've ever worked on. And it was, it was allowing me to, 
partially intellectually and partially practically in an actuality move forward this thesis in this world of, all right, if we can open up human time uh, instead of doing this menial task like driving Chinese food around and let the robots do that and open up musicians' time to make more music or intellectuals' time to, to do more research, what can be accomplished? I, was, I, was, I love doing that and that's how I got to San Francisco. I, I love the, the dot connecting uh, especially in hindsight, as the quote, yeah, and you stole one of my questions. I was going to ask your favorite quote, so maybe that's it. But I find oh, that's, it, that, that's that's not quite the favorite, but it's up there. It's a good one. Well, yeah, okay, we'll get we'll circle back to that then. But I find I I find it so fascinating too that, and we'll get to Riveter, but where that aspect of like helping people in those situations uh, better their life. So maybe that was like subconsciously driven. But uh, yeah, if you want to touch on that, and then I had uh, one other point. Yeah, I mean, and I'll connect to that one step further. So mm. late last year, uh, I was at the self-driving car company. We were very commercially successful. We had some of the biggest deals in the self-driving car industry. And it was awesome. But I kind of kept coming back to what happens when I'm right, right? Like what happens when self-driving cars are out there and delivery drivers don't have a job. Like what do musicians do? Do they really just sit around playing more music? And like, how are they going to pay rent with that? What happens to a factory when robotics can do the job of an 8,000 person factory and you could take that with some robots and 10 people to turn off and on the lights. What happens to those people like new factory jobs don't just pop up. Or if you're a professional taxi driver or truck driver, like, you're not going to just all of a sudden become an engineer or, or a data scientist or like whatever techno utopian stuff people hope for. Like something needs to happen with your time when you're not dedicating that time to work that's now being done by robots. And, and there's a huge uh, challenge to that in terms of what happens to capitalism, what happens to democracy, what happens to, um, to people's mental states. But there's also a really interesting opportunity in that. Meaning, Anthony, if you're a delivery driver and you were working eight hours a day as a delivery driver, which did not allow you to spend eight hours a day doing other things, what can you now do more of? Can you make more music? Can you be more creative? Can you spend more time with your family? Could you volunteer more and help people who haven't had their time free? You can do all these things and we just need to figure out the economic structure of how you get compensated, how you get rewarded, what upper mobility looks like. So late last year, I started like thinking about all these things. Early this year, and I started interviewing people who closed down factories who have been laid off or whatever else, just like hear what their lives are like when they lose their jobs. And early this year, shortly before COVID began, uh, my buddy was the head of engineering at that same self-driving car company. We connected the dots one step forward and said, great, let's start this company that like helps people who are out of work manage their time and save money. And we started that and all of a sudden COVID hit and millions of people were basically in this position that automation will be putting people into the next 10 years, meaning jobs went away and there's not like another job around the corner, right? Like you could be in any industry and if you lost your job this year, you're not getting another job for at least a few months. You know, maybe for some people, it's going to be unfortunately a year. So how can they spend their time? What's the best thing that they could be doing? What's empowering about this new reality? And how can we as a society support them to do that? And so if you just chart this path, you know, at first it was Adriel started this delivery company and hundreds of delivery drivers. They were making money, but not doing things that they found valuable. Then he went to this automated delivery company, autonomous delivery company, and said, great, let's free the people from doing this work. The robots will do it. But what are the people going to do? And now it's this third step of like, all right, this seems to be the one thing that people aren't, I haven't heard people talking about or working on. What will people do when they're freed from doing deliveries because the robots are doing them, but they've got all this time. What will they do? How will they react and respond and live and, and, and things like that? So that's that, that last step, at least up to this date. Yeah. Sure there's many more stars to connect in the future, I hope, but that's that that last star at the moment. Exactly. And, and I, for, for two points, I, I see the, uh, there was probably another reason you and Yuri connected, but that, that uh, relation with uh, HR and, and helping the unemployed and helping the employed as well. I'm sure you guys have really amazing conversations, but uh, 
also this thing of like, and I wanted to bring this up too. So I'm really glad we waited until I asked this question, but your openness to show your failures. Um, really cool. Like the one thing I, when I do pre, like pre-research before talking to people, I really try to see what they're about. And the one thing I really got from you is this vulnerability slash openness to share here are my lessons from this, or I failed at this, this is where I'm at. And it's just this constant iteration as though you were to build an autonomous uh, delivery vehicle, you have to iterate as you go, you know, the nuts and bolts. So for you, it's like you're iterating not only on your purpose, but like uh, what works with what, and also what's aligning with the timing of the, uh, the macro of the market. And I wanted to bring up one quote before we move forward, which kind of will encapsulate um, what you've talked about, but or two actually, you said for every bull Tesla, there are thousands of failed attempts. So that could speak for itself. Um, and then you said there's this maxim in startups that the greatest companies are started in the most difficult times. Uh, the biggest tech companies of our time, Uber, Airbnb started in 08. Surviving the difficult times means you'll be more resilient when they get good again. So it's cool it's cool to see someone be transparent about their failures um, and then start something new in a time when there seems to be so much external failure. Um, but yeah, kudos to that for sure. Uh, well, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, where, where I'm most transparent about failures is the gong, which you mentioned, which is this podcast yeah. I started a year ago where I talk about sales at startups and I started it because I was doing sales at startups and I wanted to get better. And so I just started interviewing people and we had amazing guests. We had the founder of Netflix. We had the CEO of Upwork. We had VP of sales at huge cloud companies. It was really cool. And then when I started this new company, Riveter, I said, great, like, let me openly share about sales at my startup at Riveter and what that's like. And it's mostly me rambling. Uh, and it's, so I don't know if it's interesting to people or not, but it, it gives me an outlet to, I'd say I, I, what I like about it is two things. And the whole season, just so folks know, is really just me talking about stuff that's going on at Riveter, successes, fails, wins, decisions, ideas, hopes, whatever. Yeah, documentation, yeah. Yeah, and, and I do it for two reasons. The first is very personal. The second is a little more outward. The personal reason is it gives me a chance to both think through decisions and reflect upon them. So I get to say, speak aloud for 10 minutes, you know, usually to myself, sometimes to my fiance who asks me questions, but usually to myself, like, here's an idea I have and I wonder where it'll go and whatever else. Uh, and I get to reflect on it or I get to, I guess to kind of document it as well and look back and say, Oh, like, that was a bad decision. What was I thinking? And I guess I actually have this recording of yeah. what I was thinking. But the second is more outward is to say, I, I mean, we have, we have listeners and people text, literally text me or email me after episodes where I say, Hey, that was, here's a failure. Like, let me share. And they go, Hey man, like you got to keep it up. Like you can do this or interesting episode or when a success happens, you know, they say, Oh, that was an awesome idea. I'm going to try to implement it. I, I hope people can actually take from my, my huge transparency on this podcast and apply it to their own, startups or lives or whatever else and, and get better in that way. So uh, I, I hope it brings somebody uh, either a laugh at, at when things aren't going so well my way or an idea when things are. And it, and it adds a level of self-awareness too. Uh, you know, you talked about the, the key pillars to a person during this time, but also an entrepreneur like that of patience, that of self like introspection. But uh the reflection you have is really interesting because that'll add more self-awareness. And for you, besides the, the gong recordings, do you do anything else for increasing that self-awareness, whether it be a meditation or like productive meditation with running? Like what, what are your go-tos? Uh, so my uh, fiance yells at me every night at dinner. <laughs> So that's, that's a good one where she tells me that was a bad idea. That was a bad idea. You can do better there. And yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to say she's right about 95% of the time. So uh, that, that helps. Yeah. Uh, in terms of additional self-reflection, uh, uh, bike rides are really, really big for me. So I, I started, I bought a bike about two months before the Ironman. I literally was not a bike rider before, you know, in any capacity for it besides knowing how to ride a bicycle. 
Uh, but I bought a bike two months before. I rode it probably five times. I did the Ironman, loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, and I've become very into cycling since. So long bike rides are really big for me. And what I usually do is I will uh, listen to a podcast for the first half. And in the second half, I will give myself one specific challenge. And my goal in this bike ride is just to think about that one challenge. So I'm not just going to like let my mind go where it goes. Usually I will say, Hey, this is a problem that I'm having. You know, people aren't using the resources in the right way, or we're not growing fast enough, or how can we, how do I close this deal? Or what can I do to make this a better process or like one very specific thing. And I will spend that hour reflecting upon that one thing. And I think being outside, having dynamic changes, right? Like every, every 20 seconds, you're at a different 200 meter stretch. Um, So having dynamic changes is really helpful uh, in any self-reflection. And then I journal uh, probably five, four or five days or nights a week. And that's, uh, that one's a little more loose and it's just whatever comes to mind at the time. Got it. That's cool. I, I, uh, I love that. And I both resonate because I have this one principle slash practice that I got from Josh Waitskin, but also like connecting some dots from other people. It's like, uh, during productive meditations of, like you said, runs or walks or, or bike rides, thinking about one hard thing, but also before I go to bed, thinking about like the most pressing important question and it's kind of letting my subconscious do the work for me. Um, yeah, Josh Waitskin's a weirdo. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's a very intense guy, right? <laughs> like world chess champion and jujitsu black belts and all these other things like super, super genius. Uh, but I like listening to people like that. Not because I can connect with most of what they're saying. Like, I mean, he, his book, the art of learning, like went way over my head because I think he's just a thousand times smarter than I am and more intense and stuff. Yeah. But, but if you can like listen to people on the extremes and then pull out the version that works for you and dilute it to the level that it works for you, well, then you can find things like that. So when Josh Weisskin says every night he thinks about the most pressing things in his life and lets his subconscious work, I believe it. For me, you know, maybe twice a week, I remember to do that, but I really do enjoy that. All right. Like here's, here's what I'm going to get out of it. And sometimes it's professional. Sometimes it's personal. Sometimes it's whatever. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he's got a lot of those, a lot of those ideas that are particularly, uh, extreme in a good way, extreme for, for the, the regular layman, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. I, I was gonna go down a path of something about podcasting and that crossover with with that, but I would love to hear your process for reading and what you may be reading now. Cause I know you're an avid reader and I would love to dabble in the mind of someone who's constantly trying to learn, but like what resources and, and texts they're consuming in order to, to level up in their own way. Sure. So I read uh, pretty much anything and everything long form. Yeah. Uh, the only, I'm not really into, I read very little news. I read very few blogs except uh, for Tim Urban's Wait But Why. Uh, it's the only blog I read and probably because great. it's long form and the dude basically writes books on the internet. Yeah, he's great. Uh, and I think I've read everything on the site. Maybe I missed something. His latest series is very long. I'm not totally done with that. <laughs> but, um, I will read everything and everything from fiction, historical fiction, traditional business, uh, old, old-timey old business, books from the 1800s. Uh, this year alone, I read everything from like Crime and Punishment and um, the Samuel Insull biography, both of which are 19th century works, all the way through uh, like AI superpowers and the Andrew Yang book. Oh, what was that? Um, mm. Whatever, uh, The War on People, uh, which were both written in the last year or two. So very wide range. I read a lot in the morning, probably 80% of my reading happens first thing in the morning where I'll wake up, go straight to the couch and, and read for 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, and I am not, I tried to be fairly copious. There was a year in which one of my New Year's resolutions was write down every single book that you read and write down some notes. And so I kept a, a tracker and had like name, author, uh, some notes, what I liked about it, a rating, whatever. 
And I think the reflection was great. And for some people, it's incredibly important. Um, but for me, oftentimes, my reading process is simply just ingesting as much as possible. And if I really like something, I will absolutely keep it open on my desk or post it in there and come back to it. So there's a few books this year that I've absolutely loved bits of that have had important chapters to me. And I've reread those numerous times. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm not on Goodreads necessarily. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not as like um, logical about my tracking of the reading, but it's just as much and as wide variety mm -hmm. as I can. Yeah, that, that, uh, everyone is, their reading is, their reading approach is subjective, but yours reminds me of Naval's where he talks about, let me consume as much as possible because somehow it'll circulate in my mind and it'll come back to me. And you always have it to reference. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, there's, I've heard other people who say, hey, they reflect after every chapter or like after every book, they sit and they journal for a little bit. Uh, my fiance, after every book, she, she puts a post it at the quotes that she likes and she writes down all those quotes in her journal and just to have them. Um, I will sometimes tweet a quote that I like uh, and I'll usually credit the book and the author. Um, so like every once in a while, you know, my, my Twitter feed has a bunch of random quotes that I like, but I'm, I'm a little bit more of that style, which is as much as possible. What I am working on is not being afraid to put down a book. Yeah, there used to be a time where I'd like, I'd have to finish everything, even if it's just like, it's just not hitting home for me, but I'd be like, listen, really smart person wrote it, or a lot of people recommended it, like, let me finish. And I, I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit better around, like, you know what, I got 40% I got of the way through, this one's not for me, let me move on. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying my best with that too. But they say there's four approaches to reading. There's uh, elementary, where you, you read like a website level, read a sign. There's skimming. And then there's uh, analytical. And then this last one I can't uh, recall, but it's more of like reading and then connecting dots through summaries and then also other books you've read. Whatever that one is, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, connecting themes. Uh, and then the one question I was going to come back to and while we're on the topic, I'll just ask these two before that. What's your favorite book and your favorite quote? Uh, I'll answer it in the past way, and then I'll be a little more obtuse about it. My favorite book is Alice in Wonderland. My favorite quote is Etched into Wood. Wow. It is sometimes I believe in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Beautiful. Uh, I love that quote from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and it is etched on a piece of wood above my desk. <laughs> uh, that I just flashed to the video stream. Uh, I think that book is, is, is whimsical, it's silly, it's wise, it's thoughtful, it's, it's everything that, that life is. Uh, it's goofy, it's confusing. And so I'm, uh, I love that quote in that book. Um, more broadly, some of the most influential books that I've read on the nonfiction side are things like uh, the Leonardo da Vinci biography by Walter Isaacson, who's the guy who did Jobs most famously. Um, mm. I loved AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee, uh, which came out in the last couple of years and was, was very influential. Uh, this year, I read a book called Give Work by Lila Jana, who unfortunately passed away this year. She was super young, 37. She's the founder of Sama Source, which is this wonderful half nonprofit, half for profit AI company creating jobs in East Africa, like literally everything she managed to do. And, and that was an incredible one. Um, and then there's, you know, in fiction, Harry yeah. Potter, probably. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's a, you got through all the, the entire series, like all of the books? New, more times than I would like to admit, Anthony. Wow. More times than I'd like to admit. My, my childhood was pretty much just rereading Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, large level of uh, fantasy and imagination on your end then, I'm sure. Which we'll, we'll get to some, some dreams uh, at the end because we always cap off with bigger dreams you have. But before that, last question was, and this might be really helpful because it intersects with sales and business, but what is your approach for getting high-level names on your podcast on the gong the first season 
but also just networking in general because it seems like you know everyone and their mother and their brother so i would love to have you dissect that to try to have others pull away something from it and also maybe i can learn something as well uh two bits of advice the first is be fearless too many people are afraid to reach out to people that punch above their weight class and you absolutely have no reason to be uh sending somebody an email making it super clear what they're going to give you what you want from them what the ask is and what they're going to get out of it uh you can go as high and as far and as wide as you want and you will more often than not especially if you're younger especially if you're a student oh my god if you're a student people will give you anything just because they want to help out a student so first thing is be fearless the second thing is always leverage the network of the people who are already giving you something. Uh, ben Franklin used to do this thing where he knew that if somebody gave him something or invested in him, they care more about his success. So Benjamin Franklin would go around to people he respected, ask to borrow books. And he asked to borrow so many books, he'd never get around to reading them. But then like a month later, he'd give the book back and say, Oh, thank you so much for the book. It was a great book. All of a sudden, that person became invested in him and they wanted Ben Franklin to succeed because Ben Franklin read the book that I offered and Ben Franklin thinks I'm a genius and Ben would go ask for favors and they would go give those favors. So same thing here. Once somebody has done something for you, you know, this is not some like twisted Robert Greene 48 Laws of Power thing. <laughs> it's just true and it's a good way to move forward. Once somebody has done something for you, they, they clearly care about you. They clearly want you to succeed. It's in their best interest for you to succeed. It's in, it's just, they, especially if somebody's very successful, like they just want to see more people uh, get what they need, find ways to leverage that person's network. And so I'd ask every person I interviewed, hey, who are the best three people you can introduce me to? And sometimes it went nowhere, sometimes it went somewhere. Sometimes the people weren't as interesting as I would have liked, but sometimes the people are absolute rock stars. And so uh, do not be afraid to uh, reach, you know, shoot high and certainly do not forget to leverage the networks of others. Yeah, leverage, that's a, an important topic that's coming up more and more, but uh, I appreciate you sharing that, most definitely. And then in terms of those tactical things, and maybe you're, you're definitely using that to accomplish bigger things, what are some of your, going back to Alice in the Wonderland type, uh, what you do every morning, what are, what are your bigger dreams, whether it be with Riveter now or long-term? for yourself that you want to accomplish? Uh, long term, I, I want to live until my 111th birthday. That's, that's, that's always, always been a goal. Got to make it to 111. Mm -hmm. uh, very long term. Love it. <laughs> um, I, I want to, I want to have, have kids, have a family that I'm really excited about. I want to be able to have, the flexibility in my life to be able to spend it how I want with the people I want doing the things that I want. Um, flexibility certainly means, you know, as much money as you need to be able to do that, but it also means having the confidence to know the confidence, the, the wisdom, uh, dare I say the, the thoughtfulness to mm -hmm. the reflection, to be able to know what it is that you want and to be able to have those priorities and, and push the rest to the side. Um, I think, I think Ray Dalio has the line that uh, in life you could have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. Mm. And so knowing what are the things that I want and which ones are going to be my priorities and, and prioritizing those above all else is really important. You know, I prioritize family, I prioritize travel. I prioritize, you know, getting a cup of coffee with a good friend in the middle of the day, prioritize long walks. And what do I need to do? in my professional life in order to allow all that. And then how can I tie that, you know, my personal interest and allow other people to have that. So that's, that's the goal of Riveters to say, Hey, like we have this promise, this next industrial revolution, this, the AI movement that's going to free humanity from drudgery. Well, amazing. How can I help humanity find and exercise this newfound freedom? Because theoretically, for the first time in human history, or no, not from the, for the first time since the advent of farming that literally required every hand to be available. Before, you know, before farming, we were hunter gatherers. People had free time up the wazoo. Like you go, you go hunt, you kill a bear, you eat the bear for about a week because you figured out how to 
salt things and, and keep them uh, for a little bit. You'll pick some berries, you call it a day. You know, you're mostly just lounging, hanging out with family, telling stories, painting your face, you know, going to war a little bit, which maybe we shouldn't be going to war as much. But how can we, you know, 10,000 years ago, we got farming and humanity was tied down to their plot of land. And that created a society in which you have to, like, you know, most people live paycheck to paycheck or crop to crop, season to season. If this promise, and it's a big if, but if this promise of robotics and AI does come true in the next 20 years, at least in bits and pieces, it'll take, you know, centuries to really play out. But if it begins to come true over the next 20 years, and, and you might, you see that happening already, but if it continues to happen that way, what is possible for people? What is possible for people as a whole, but what is possible for individual people? What is possible for Anthony or for Adriel or for Abby or for, for somebody whose time has been freed in this new way? I'm very interested in that. And when you talk about dreams, the first dream is figuring out what, what I'm even saying and actually actually figuring out the specifics of that. But the second is to, to see people define themselves in more ways than their job title and to do so with confidence, with pride, with joy, uh, and, and, and with a lot of calm. And I, I hope that happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of the boiling it down to a specific, I mean, that's coming through what you're building and like what you're realizing needs to be built and what you've learned. So uh, slowly actualizing that, that dream and, and that goal, but it's, it's cool to see and I, I enjoy watching from afar and I, I appreciate meeting you just recently, but I'm excited to see the growth and, and see the evolution of Riveter and, and yourself. But I, I, I would love to leave the door open. I always do at the end, if you want to mention anything else, but I, you had a ton of gems just before. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave it at that, man. I think, uh, I hope everybody has a fantastic day. I hope everybody calls somebody who they love. Hope everybody has a good cup of coffee and a nice long walk. And I'm wishing you all the best. Yeah, enjoy the rest of that cup of coffee. Thank you. <laughs> it's over. This is a long podcast. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Goal accomplished. All right, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anthony.